Hey everybody, how are you? Good crowd. All right, let me just get this set Come up on here. Silence, please. Thank you. Oh yeah, I got to turn my computer sounds off. All right. Great. Well, th hey, hey, welcome everybody. We're going to talk about uh, autonomous cars. Everybody excited to talk about autonomous cars? Yeah. And Waymo specifically with John Krafchick. Hey, the expert on it. Good to be here. Um, first things first, I want to let everybody know that we're going to do an audience Q and A at the end of our conversation. So you need to uh, check out Slido and log on to that, and then just put in the code South by Southwest, and uh, we'll get the questions to look at it. I don't really know what Slido is. It sounds kind of like what you'd call like a dog on a hockey rink, but um, <laughs> slide, F Fido, I know. You're thinking, is it, did that vice reporter just make a dad joke? But what you didn't know is the dog is incredibly high. Anyway, <laughs> so let's get started with this thing. John, that, that was my prepared joke about dogs on a... You had that set up, didn't I you? I did, I really did. did. I worked on that last night. Um, let's start out with just talking about the idea that I think I kind of know what Waymo does, and I think I kind of understand what autonomous cars are, but I feel like the conversation is sort of confusing to a lot of people. Tell me a bit about just sort of what Waymo is doing and a bit where the car space is right now. Yeah, sure thing. So um, first thing is we're, we're actually not a, a car company. Waymo's a technology company. And one way to think about what we're doing that I think is, is conceptually simple to grasp is we're working to build the world's most experienced driver. That, that's really what we're trying to do. And then install um, that driver in things like cars, but also trucks and other forms of ground transportation. And I think the world needs a technology like this to move forward. If you look at the statistics globally, and, and maybe some of you folks who follow the space have heard this, 1.25 million people die every year in car accidents around the world. It's sort of crazy. It's like 140 people dying in a 737 crash every hour of every day. Um, that's the total uh, global fatality count um, on the world's roadways. It's, it's, it's pretty awful. Um, so we've always been motivated um, um, at Google and, and at Waymo to, to go ahead and address that. The project started a long time ago. It's nearly 10 years old now, um, back in 2009 um, at Google. It was the Google Self-Driving Car Project, and we have been working on this um, really since then continuously, um, backed by uh, the vision of folks like Larry Page and Sergey Brin, who um, originally saw these cars working as part of something called the DARPA Challenge. Um, it's interesting to think that self-driving cars really got seeded um, by the U.S. government, um, which had a contest um, to see which self-driving car could work best, and that really helped move the early pace. You used to see that, right? Like a, all the universities would bring their cars. Yeah, the you had Carnegie Mellon, and Stanford, right, okay. and MIT, and, and the little tracks and all you those. You were there cars. at the very beginning when it was sort of very. It was still very sort of the earliest of this technology. It, yeah, and it's very very infancy and. It's going to make a great story someday that um, you know these Google guys, um, Larry and Sergey, had this idea that um, in, in the early parlance, computers should be driving cars, and they could probably or maybe do a better job than, than humans actually could. Um, and if you go back in time, this period when the DARPA challenges were going on, it was really before the great um, recession that the US experienced, which was really hard on the automotive industry. Um, but yet, here was Google seeing this as a great, wonderful future application of technology to help the world. So that's sort of what got things going. That got it going. And then, I understand, you know, we're good. we have a little bit of a video presentation to start out with now. Because, because so, so we start out with sort of this DARPA challenge idea, yeah. kind of the very basis of, of the technology, and then you, have achieved, then you achieve this, that little bubble car that we remember. Little right? bubble car, the little bubble so car. We have a video of that, can we run that? We have, we have this, so um, this now, fast forward to 2015, um, and this is on the streets of Austin, Texas. So right here in Austin. Right here in Austin. Let's hear it for Austin. What, what you're seeing is the world's first self-driving car ride on public roads with no safety net. Um, that car has no controls in it, um, our little Firefly car, no steering wheel, no brake pedal, and the fellow you see, Steve Mann, is blind. And that's in 2015? That's in 2015. And that's the so the first ride of a car without a driver at all, mm -hmm. done by Waymo, it was, or was it called Waymo then? It was, it was the Google self-driving okay, right. car. Okay, right, and that was here in Austin. Yeah, that was okay, here in great. Austin. Okay, so, so, so and this, this very car is, um, is in the museum um, in Austin here. So when we're watching this video, what were we watching? Like, what is happening in, like, a, around the outside of, of that video? Are people, 
you know, it's, it, are the engineers like, okay, this is totally going to work. This is great. We got this. I mean, what, what, what are we looking so at? Exactly? It, it, was, it was an amazing, uh, it was an amazing scene. So this happened in Austin, but, but Mission Control was in Mountain View, um, California, and we were all watching this in our little garage. There were probably about maybe 150 or 200 of us on the team at the time. It was, it was a pretty small team. We're much, much bigger now. Um, and we were honestly all there, um, very nervous very anxious, because this, this had never been done before. We thought about this as our Kitty Hawk moment, in a way, or, or landing a man on the moon. I mean, this was a super big deal. We didn't know what the other agents in the world were going to be doing on this ride, the other cars, the other traffic, the other humans, the pedestrians. There was a woman with a, um, with a stroller with a baby in it, you know, that, that the car had to interact with at, at one point during this drive. That wasn't a planted baby? That was an it was not a planted it was baby. It was an actual random um, baby. Okay, so, okay. Um, so, so that yeah, was, you can imagine yeah. the team being really nervous about that. And of course, when it was done, it was like, oh my gosh, we did it. And what was really interesting is we kept it, we kept it quiet for a while. We didn't talk about it until a year later when the Google self-driving car project became Waymo. Um, and we use that as, as a launch video saying, you know, this technology is closer than you think. Uh -huh. um, and actually, we did this a year ago. And now as Waymo, our role is to bring this technology to the world and let regular folks, just like all of us in this room, have access to that technology. And that's sort of the news. You know, as a reporter, one thing I like to do is tell the audience, here, wh where's the news, right? Yeah. It sounds like, so, we're, so that video that we just saw, from 2015, that was big news when it happened. Right. But now you've got a new video that is, that, that's the news of why people are here today. This is pretty special. So um, you guys are gonna be the first people to see um, a, little, a little video that we put together. Um, so let me explain what we're doing now and, and then we'll cue the video. Um, so we established something uh, around this time last year in Phoenix called the Early Writer Program. And, and um, we said basically to the people at Phoenix, hey, help us figure out how to launch self-driving cars. We want to understand how real humans with real families in different stages of their lives might use self-driving cars to get around for all of their daily transportation. Um, by the way, it was really cool. I mean, we had 20,000 hand raisers um, immediately with no marketing. They just said, yeah, I want to I be a part of the future. Let me, let me help you. Um, so we've been working now with hundreds of folks in the greater Phoenix area who have had access to our cars for the last year or so. And for most of these rides, we've had a test driver in the driver's seat just to monitor everything, to make sure everything was, was cool and safe. But over the course of this year, we've gained increasing confidence that we could remove that safety driver um, from the front row and actually let these regular citizens of Phoenix experience a truly self-driving car ride in our Waymo uh, Pacifica minivan. So um, what we're showing you today are some of those first truly driverless rides. We're doing this now in Phoenix. It's so insanely cool. Um, we started this about a month ago, and this is just a little video clip that shows the expressions on the faces um, and the joy um, and other reactions that you'll see of people riding in self-driving cars on public roads. All right, let's watch that. Okay, day one of self-driving, are you ready? <laughs> Oh. oh, this is weird. <laughs> this is the future. <laughs> yeah, she was like, is there no one driving that car? <laughs> I knew it. I was waiting for it. <laughs> you certainly never know that there wasn't someone driving this car. <laughs> Yo, car! Thank you, car. <laughs> yeah, thank you, car. What do you think? App actual, <laughs> actual applause. Actual applause. That's John, so you're cool. getting applause for driving people around in a minivan. How about that? that? I don't know what your favorite part was as you watched that thing. I, I love the, the, the one gentleman saying, yo, car. Um, I thought that was pretty <laughs> cute. Um, but for us at Waymo, um, the most rewarding things were the yawns and then the fellow who fell asleep. Um, because yeah, that, that was remarkable to me. I mean, this guy. I mean, you, this is a. You're in a vehicle that's. I mean, you're watching the the steering wheel turn itself. Yes. It's driving, and this guy's already just like I'm. Pa I mean, I'm, I'm I'm passed out. Like I'm am done. I'm that. I feel that comfortable and safe in the thing. That um, that thing is what we need to bridge to, right? Which is trust um, for all of us, because this is a brand new technology. It might seem scary to a lot of people, um, and yeah, that's exactly the response that that we want. That they feel so comfortable with this driver which we've worked so hard on. This, this driver, by the way, has driven five 
million miles autonomously already in 25 different cities across the US. Um, we've tested that driver. By the driver, you mean like the technology, the, the, the technology, like, the like yeah. hive brain that, that the hive, learns yeah, all Yeah, sort of like a hive brain. And that's the cool thing about this driver is everything that we learn in one of our cars gets passed to all of the other cars that have, um, again, the same compute, the same software, the same sensor set. Got it. So it's really this one, um, one driver. Um, we think he could be already the world's most experienced driver. Um, and then we test this driver, too, through simulation. Um, so we've tested him or her through 5 billion miles of sim. Um, we have over 20,000 different um, really challenging test scenarios that we put the driver through, the way I'm a driver through at our Castle um, test facility in Central California. So um, having that sort of reaction is, is just what our engineers want to see. People are so comfortable, they're yawning. But so the difference between these two videos that we've seen now, this one in 2015 here in Austin, that was one guy driving, obviously successfully, not yeah. hitting a baby, which is, would have been a bad PR move. That would have been guys, a bad I thing. Assume, yeah. uh, to now a guy passing out in the back of a minivan um, is what? I mean, what is the difference between those two videos that we're seeing? Like, what, is, what has happened in between those two? Yeah, so in, a, in, a, in addition to about two and a half years of, of calendar time passing between those two events, um, it's really Waymo taking that technology and growing it at scale. Um, so now we have fleets of cars in Phoenix um, able to do this um, all at the same time. And, and we're increasing the scale of that operation. So um, we've purchased already hundreds of cars um, from Fiat Chrysler. We've just put in another order for thousands more cars. And um, as we grow our operations in Phoenix, we'll move um, to other cities in the US and eventually globally um, providing this service. But essentially there isn't I mean, I'm, forgive me if I, I'm just going to take this all the way down. Yeah. You talk about the, you know, that, that first ride, there are people in Mountain View looking at Mission Control, yeah. I assume watching everywhere that car is going, Absolutely. Kind of sweating over it. And now it's literally just like there are a bunch of cars running around Phoenix, people just pressing buttons, getting in them and driving. That's exactly right. Okay. Yeah, there's, no, there's not that same analogous Mission Control moment where there are hundreds of engineers watching each of those rides. Obviously, that doesn't scale. Um, this has gotten to the point now where it is routine. Um, for the team, and it's just part of our operations. So the idea is that, like so you're saying, it's actually happening now. It's happening now. Yeah. Um, well, that, that, that leads me to my next question, because I have to ask you, uh, there's been a lot of talk about autonomous cars at South by Southwest this year, right? Elon Musk uh, popped up. I don't know if you consider him a competitor or what, but he popped up and he said that he thinks that by the end of next year, self-driving will encompass essentially all modes of driving and be at least 100% to 200% safer than a person. By the end of next year, we're talking 18 months from now. What do you think about that? Yeah. Do you well, think that? I, I think, um, and, and I don't know who's, who's following our progress, but I think the point is that, um, in a way, and maybe the key message is, it's here now. Um, and it is on public roads now. And, and regular folks are able to experience a fully self-driving experience, um, which is very, very different from much of, of what is talked about in the world. And I think this is really confusing, um, actually. We confuse, as a society, um, driver assist you know, and, and, and there's this whole SAE scale that goes from L1, which is like cruise control. Uh, most of us are used to cruise control in our cars. And then there's something called L2, which is cruise control. It'll hold your speed, but it'll oh. also keep you in your lane, right? Um, and then L3 is a different form of autonomy that we're not sure will ever exist. And then what we've demonstrated here is something called L4, where the human in the car doesn't have to pay any attention as long as the car is within its geographically confined and mapped area, um, which is our situation in Phoenix. So um, I think we confuse ourselves. Like there have been accidents in other cars that really aren't self-driving cars, um, but they were described by the media as, oh my gosh, first fatality in a self-driving car. Um, and what Elon would be the first to say is, wait, that was not a self-driving car. Um, that was just our Tesla with a rudimentary autopilot functionality. Sort of advanced that, cruise control. Advanced cruise control, uh -huh. right. And that, that poor driver, Joshua Brown, he, he really should have been paying attention and then everything would have been fine. So I think we as a society, we, we sort of get ourselves confused sometimes. Um, every technology that you can buy in a car right now, you have to pay attention all the time. You should always have your hands on the steering wheel and you should be, you should be very alert while you're driving. Um, we don't have self-driving cars you can buy yet. Um, but through technology like we're showing at Waymo, there will be technology that you can use in something that is more like a ride-sharing service. That's how we're going to deploy it to the world. Yeah, I mean, I think, I, think, I think the video makes clear people aren't even sitting in the driver's seat. The car's driving. They're watching it. Right. I think what made that quote pop out to people was the timeline he's talking about of how quickly 
this is going to happen. So you have these cars in Phoenix. Yeah. How fast is it going to be in the rest of our lives? Is 18 months like a logical conclusion yeah. before people are going to be in a city and pressing a button and having Waymo show up? So our approach has been to start the technology in environments where um, we're very confident that we can be very, very safe. So Phoenix was a great place for us to start. Um, fairly new city, orthogonal street arrays. The weather is typically very good, although it's incredibly hot. And that, that puts a lot of stress and, and pressure um, on our sensing, which we're fine with. Um, with time, we'll solve other problems. It's one of the reasons now, Evan, we're, we're testing in Michigan. Um, we've had a great winter in Michigan because there has been a lot of snow and our cars have learned a lot about driving in very challenging snowy conditions. So eventually we'll get to cities um, in the Northeast, places like New York and Detroit and Chicago. Um, but that'll come later um, after we do, um, after we launch in cities like Phoenix and perhaps the Bay Area. So first sort of the warm weather people get it. Probably That's true. That's what you're saying? It's probably okay. true, yeah. Maybe you should have a convertible. Well, there you go. That's <laughs> it's possible. Um, uh, well, what do you mean by soon? How, I mean, that's, a, that's an obvious journalism follow-up question. What's, what, is, what does soon mean for Northeast? Um, for Northeast, when we be in the Northeast? Um, I would say it's, um, you know, it's going to take some time um, to get it launched in, in all weather areas. I wouldn't want to give a specific date. Um, but starting in the smile states in the southwest, um, places like Florida, will be before places like the Northeast and Chicago. All right. Okay. And I know you want a year, and I can't really give I tried. I tried. That's all right. Um, let's, uh, let's move into, because what's interesting about this, about this video that we just saw, and I've been, I, you know, been thinking about this, is that you now are answering, you're able to answer some of the questions about living with autonomous cars that have been sort of floating around. Because you have people actually, I mean, there's a guy sleeping in it. You have people actually using them. You've seen this. Yeah. So what have you learned about how people are living with this technology, like how it, 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 it impacting their lives or changes their lives. Do you have any sort of early data about that? Um, I think we've learned a lot just how to make this actually work for the folks we, we seek to serve. Um, so for example, we learned um, the importance of getting pick up and drop off areas um, really precise. And, and one of the things that maybe shouldn't have been a surprise, but was a surprise to us at Waymo is um, folks are really picky about where they want to be picked up um, and dropped off. And, and a great example of that is grocery shopping. So think about that for a minute. When we go grocery shopping in our personal cars, it's a fairly straightforward process. We park probably as close as we can to the, uh, to the door unless we want to get some exercise. And we, bring, uh, we go shopping and we come back with our grocery cart and we put the, the groceries in the car. Um, when you take a self-driving car to the grocery store, it's a little more complicated. Um, so you want to be dropped off um, very close to the door. And that's easy because the car doesn't have to park, which is great for the world, by the way. Self-driving cars don't need nearly as many parking spaces. So the, the drop off is easy. The pickup, uh, we learned, was pretty challenging. And we figured it out, but it wasn't obvious. So um, our first idea on pickup was, of course, the person wants to be picked up close to the exit door um, with their grocery cart so that they can load the groceries in the car and then be driven away. But what we found was there's this social negotiation that comes um, with that task. So if you're the person with your groceries and you want to put them in the, in the minivan, you notice that other humans are waiting in their cars because your self-driving car is blocking the road the, of the parking lot right next to the exit door. Um, and we got feedback from our, from our great folks in Phoenix saying, you know, I appreciate you picking me up close to the exit door so I didn't have to push my cart very far, but I felt a little bit guilty <laughs> having other people wait while I loaded my groceries. So um, now we pick up closer to the cart return place, um, which makes a lot more sense. Now, that wasn't obvious. But that's a little insight um, that we learned. So people are how considering this work. how this affects the the drivered community. I the drivered community, yeah. exactly. They were okay. worried about the drivered community. It's like I don't want to inconvenience uh, the poor drivers who are now having to wait for me um, to load up my groceries. That's really interesting. I was fascinated by it in the video too that you had. Sort of, I mean, I know it's a corporate video, but you had like all ages in there. Like, are you seeing that people? That's is, intentional. Is it, is yeah. it not just young people who are doing this? Is all I mean, who's well, we, so we had those 20,000 applications. We yeah. literally were able to pick a really diverse group of folks. So we picked, um, you know, there's, there's one family that has six in the household. We picked um, singles, couples, working families, um, some retired folks. So there's a whole gamut of, of people in, in different life stages so that we could learn from um, all of them.
But that flies in the face of some of what we've heard about this conversationally, that this, that this is a, uh, a, a, that this scares a lot of people, right? Because you're saying people of all different types are trying this and using it, and they're already to the point now where they're worried about offending people. They're not, it's not fear of the car. They're, they're, they're fear of what other people are going to say. It's more that they're blocking it's, the, it's honestly the, more the driveway. The social fear, yeah. I, my, um, my mother is a wonderful 98-year-old lady. She was frightened of this technology. She didn't understand why I was doing this. She had, she had no clue, like, Johnny, why? She calls me Johnny. Um, <laughs> why, why are you involved in this? You know, this is crazy. And I said, Mom, you, you need to come up and, and go for a ride, and, and let's see how you do. And so um, we got her in the car, and honestly, she was a little bit frightened um, for the first 10 or 15 seconds. Um, but in almost no time, she, she gained that confidence that we've seen time and time again. You get people in this car, and you get them to experience um, the, the intelligence of the driver, and they become very, very calm. And by the end of the, the trip, all she had to say was, Johnny, could you make this go faster? <laughs> because you know now I, I have a way to get to Kohl's. Um, <laughs> she was excited about Waymo getting her to Kohl's. Well, I actually do have a question about that. How does it drive? Does it drive like a person? Is it, is it fast? Is it, is it like a drive like a... It, it you, drives like, I would say it drives like a really good driver. Um, I don't think you would say it's too slow or it drives in grandmotherly or grandfatherly fashion. Huh? I think you would say it's assertive. Um, however, it follows the rules of the road, so it doesn't speed. I mean, it is, it's pretty anal about that. If the speed limit is 55, it will drive um, 55. Um, there are times when it might exceed the speed limit briefly to pass, if that's the safest thing to do for the world. But for the most part, it's very persnickety about following the rules, which is a good thing. Um, you know, we've been driving in Mountain View, California, our home, for nearly 10 years now. And the, the residents of, of Mountain View, I think, really appreciate seeing Waymo cars. And this is, this is the thing that's going to happen as we get more and more of these cars out on the road. They're so predictable. They always do the same thing. Um, and that's really good if you're a human, you know, you can count on this car to do that same thing every time it's at a four-way stop, or that same thing every time it approaches that intersection. Yeah, let, let me tell you what I'm asking about, the, the, how it's affecting people's lives, because it is so interesting to me. Um, you know, there's a lot of technological development going on in the world, uh, battery technology, medical technology, that are gonna affect people's lives, yeah. but none of it is talked about as much, I feel like, as this autonomous car thing. Yeah. And I have a theory about this, and I think the theory is everybody uh, has been in a car, has, you know, understands traffic, yeah. and everybody kind of thinks that there are things that should be fixed and changed about that, yeah. and most people are pretty skeptical that anything ever will be done. Right? Yeah, I think that's fair. So how those two things affect what you're, uh, you know, what, your, what, what you have to do now. You have to sort of say, first we have technology and also it actually will solve the problems that you want to solve. Yeah, yeah, that's really true. And we spent a lot of time on thinking about that and, and what is our role as Waymo in, in educating the world? Um, and there, there are a whole group of constituents we need to think about. I mean, first it's um, you know, folks in political office and regulators and others who we feel we have a responsibility to educate. Like this, this is how the technology works. Um, these are the sorts of things you should think about to help make this a graceful entry and, and be very helpful um, to society. Um, but, but also the broader public and, and how do we get that message out to them that this is safe and it's going to be an okay way to move around the world. Um, one, one thing that we've done, and, and maybe we can queue up um, this video, Evan, is, oh, is, is sure. we put together a, um, a 360 degree um, video um, that sort of mimics how our sensors see the world. So we have three kinds of sensors in the car. We have camera vision systems that see 360. Um, we have radars all the way around the car that see in radar vision um, 360. And then we have this technology called LiDAR uh, based on lasers that also see in 360 vision. So we, we put together this video. Um, where, where is this vehicle? Um, this is, is now Phoenix? somewhere in the Phoenix area. OK. Um, yeah, and you get a sense for how the car sees the world. And, and this is an interactive video. So if you, if you look at this in, in YouTube or on a cardboard um, VR sort of um, tech, you can get a sense and, and move your head around and get the view that the car sees. Um, but here you can see how um, we segment and classify various objects in the world. Um, that magic green carpet that you see is actually something that we display to consumers who are in the vehicle. So they have the opportunity to um, watch on a screen um, how the car is making its way through the world, how it sees the next corner, the trajectory it's going to take, um, that sort of thing. Fascinating. Um, 
Let me ask you, let me do a quick light, lightning round with you about some of this lifestyle stuff, lightning living round. with autonomous cars. I called a lot of people before I was gonna talk to you about what it was like, but their questions about this. Including your dad? I did call my dad, yeah. I was about to tell you. Great. But so the basic, uh, I mean, cause the basic idea is that uh, you are saying that, look, these, this service is available. Mm -hmm. So I called by pe people that I know up and said, hey, the service is available, what do you think? My dad, who is like a, a car guy, he owns like a first generation Chevy Volt. Yeah. He's like all about new car technology. He was like, yeah, right, they're gonna hack it and then all the cars are gonna crash into each other. Have him explain that to me. <laughs> so, John, make my dad comfortable about this. You know, it turns out we'd, we'd thought about that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and it is one of the great things of being a sister company to Google when you, when you think about, so we're, Google is part of this broader company called Alphabet, and Waymo is a sister company to Google, and of course, um, that idea of, of hacking and making sure that, that we're secure is really, really important to us. So um, one thing that I think will come for your dad um, is that the car has everything it needs to drive on the car itself. I think sometimes people imagine our self-driving cars being directed through the cloud, right? And there's some signals that are coming from outer space or something that are making the car turn left or right at each intersection. And of course, that's not true. Um, we have a really powerful onboard computer um, that works with the sensors um, and our onboard software to make all those decisions. Um, and there's literally no way um, for an outside signal to penetrate that level of control. So the, the steering and the braking systems are all um, completely separate um, and wouldn't be able to be accessed from an external signal. So it's, we can't have like a Bond movie plot in which all the Waymos all are Waymo cars are directed turn right. one way or another. Okay. Yes. All right. Could all right. Not fine. Um, I'm also wondering. Uh, I, I spoke to somebody from New York, a New Yorker, and she told me that her favorite thing about getting into a, uh, a, a rideshare car or a cab mm. is just asking like, okay, so is like the Manhattan Bridge blocked? Is the Lincoln Tunnel, like which way are we gonna go? Like figuring it out, right? Yeah. Does she still get to choose the route that she wants to take if she gets in a Waymo? So our, our cars are gonna choose the best and fastest route. So I guess she, does, she doesn't have to worry. Um, if she wanted to take a certain route, she might be able to hack it by choosing a, a different interim destination, perhaps, um, in the app, if she really wanted to go a, a certain way for uh, a sightseeing tour or something like that. But yeah, for the most part, we're gonna take care of, of all the routing, which you know, I think in general is a positive thing. If you've, if you've ever been in a taxi, a uh, traditional taxi, and you know that there's a much faster way to go, but the taxi driver is wanting to take you on some circuitous route for I don't know why, um, that happens all the time. You don't have to worry about that um, in a Waymo car. Trust the Waymo. It knows, Trust which, the Waymo. knows what it's doing. Trust okay. the Waymo. Um, and, you know, also a different question I thought was actually quite interesting. I talked to somebody about this, and, you know, they, uh, there's been a lot of instances where people who are, take rideshare vehicles, traditional cabs, rideshares, uh, people through maybe ideas of discrimination will not take people to certain places, won't drop them off certain places, won't let them go to places where they wanna go. Uh, we've seen some mapping software try to adopt some of this idea of like avoiding the quote bad neighborhoods, et cetera. Uh, this person wanted to know if I get into a Waymo, am I gonna, it's gonna take me everywhere I wanna go or is it going to make a decision because I'm in a lot of very expensive Google technology? Yeah, I, I think that, that's a great question and that is one of the, one of the wonderful promises that self-driving technology can, can provide. There are um, lots of underserved communities where people don't have access to their own personal cars or even public transportation. Um, Waymo cars can, can take care of that. I mean, they're not going to discriminate in any way, right? We're going to bring a car to wherever that user needs the car to pick them up um, and to drive them. So I, th I think that can be a really good thing. And um, you can take that to another level too. You saw um, Steve Mann, um, uh, the blind fellow, um, who's been a friend of our project for a long time. Um, there are a lot of people right now um, who don't have the ability to drive. Um, something like 20 to 30 million Americans who are driver's license age, but don't have a driver's license. My mom is one of those, but there are, again, tens of millions more. Um, this is a more certain way for them to get to point A to point B and meet their mobility needs. All right, and final in the lightning round is I, I talked to a, a couple, a married couple with young kids, mm -hmm. and they were excited about this idea of self-driving cars, but they're really concerned about privacy because they thought that maybe a self-driving car could like add to their date night. They don't get out very much. Yeah. They were ho I think their question was, can they have sex in a Waymo? I think <laughs> it was basically. <laughs> you know, um. <laughs> <laughs> I 
It's a great question. Evan. Um, <laughs> I can say this. Um, you know, we, we've done thousands of rides in Phoenix, and that hasn't happened yet. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I, I guess the broader question, though, is people who are in these vehicles, right? I mean, obviously, yeah. you were seeing a video. You're recording people that are driving in them. But uh, you know, this is another instance where people are maybe giving some personal data over me. Are you filming people when they're in the car? Are you trying to, you know, are you trying to police their behavior so they don't, you know, mess? I don't know. Like, what, are, what, is, yeah. what happens? Are you, are, no, I think it's I a think fair this question. Is what their larger question was. Right, if right, they right. were to do that, would it be then uploaded to, you know, or kept by somebody, or would that video be somewhere, whatever? Right. So, um, you know, I, I think the, it's, it's incumbent on us to make sure that we do it right, and, and our users need to understand what their privacy rights are um, regarding the data, their, their personal data, anything that might um, be associated with the project, and, and I think we'll do a, a really, really good job with that. Um, a lot of the data that you hear about associated with the self-driving world um, is actually the data that we gain while just driving through the world. So. Um, we might see a construction zone pop up that wasn't there in the road before. That's really important data um, that we want to share immediately with the rest of the fleet. So when the rest of the fleet comes upon this particular road with a construction zone, they'll be prepared for it. Um, that's a big chunk of the data that's often talked about in the context of self-driving cars. It's not really data privacy related, um, but rather data that's necessary to ensure that the cars can drive safely. Great. Um, all right, so and there's, a, there's, there's another set of questions I got from people that's sort of about uh, people who are car guys, right? And something yeah. about you is that you're actually, you are a car guy. Last night, yeah. we were yeah. talking a lot about, like, you were just, you know, I'm kind of a car guy too. We were talking about a 71 vet. You're looking at maybe buying a very cool car. Yeah. Um, you're a guy that likes to drive cars, right. right? I mean, simple cars, right? You have like, you have, a, I, I read somewhere you have like a, what, a cater hand? Do you still have, have that? have a caterum, yeah. Which for people who don't know a lot about cars, this is literally like a large engine, four wheels, a piece of, like a board and a seat. <laughs> it's it's not sort much, of like that. There's it's not, it's not like much going on. This is a very, this is a, this, yes. this, this is a pure driver experience car. Right. Um, is it ironic that you're trying to get less driving? I think, it, I think it feels like it's ironic, but I think it's really not. Um, so I think if we're really honest with ourselves, and, and I think this is a really interesting part of America and, and our culture, um, we associate the automobile with personal freedom. Um, and I think the auto industry, and I was, I was a part of that traditional auto industry for a couple of decades. Um, you know, we, we succeeded in creating this world where it was okay to buy your own car and then maybe buy a second car and maybe buy a third car. And, and right now, the number of cars in our national fleet in the US compared to the number of licensed drivers has never been so out of whack. We have many, many more cars than licensed drivers, which is really interesting, very curious. And the multiplicative effects on that, uh, on our society, are, are pretty huge. Um, each car has four parking spaces. So we have about 300 million cars in our national car park. We have 1.2 billion parking spaces in the US. It's crazy. Some cities have 20 to 30% of their total land space in some way dedicated to the automobile. That's terrible. And, and maybe the biggest indication of the waste in this way of, of using the automobile is the fact that 95% of the time, our cars are just sitting idle. So you have 300 million cars. That's a massive stock of capital. And 95% of the time, they're just sitting there, right? And then the other 5% of the time, when they're being driven about, typically, it's more car than we need. Um, so 75% of the time, we are driving alone in our cars. Um, and often those cars are seven seat sport utility vehicles that weigh three tons. Um, it's bad for the environment, it's CO2, there are all sorts of social issues that come from this dependency on personally owned vehicles. Um, so I really like this technology is being really transformative in that way. I think we can help shift the world to a place where we don't all feel some consumption bias need to have a big garage with three cars in that garage and only two licensed drivers in the home. But you are a car guy and you have heard this this skepticism from these guys who are who, who, it's car people, I should say. Yeah. You, you're, you're a car person, skepticism from car people, that they're worried that what you're trying to do is make it so this thing that they love is going to go away. 
Yeah. They're not going to get a chance to drive their 71 Corvette, uh, shifting the gears and moving around, driving around, a, you know, right. on, on one of those lovely California roads out there. That's right. Is that, I mean, do you understand where that skepticism comes from? And do you think that that's misplaced in this conversation? I, I, I do think it is. Um, you know, and again, I think if, if you even talk to car enthusiasts, folks who love driving, I mean, folks like me, I, I love driving. It's so much fun. But 99 times out of 100, if I had the choice, and I think if we're all honest with ourselves, we'd all agree, if we could have a car sent to you that could drive you there and you could do whatever you wanted to do with that time during the drive, you would take that deal. Um, and that's the sort of offer we wanna make to the world, like, wow, there's, a, there's another way. Um, I still think there would be a thriving um, opportunity for traditional car makers um, to build cars for this service, but also to build cars for, for those days when you do just wanna get out um, and drive on a nice road on a Sunday morning. Okay. Uh, and I wanna ask you a question about the automotive industry because you've come from there. You've, yeah. you've, you've worked there before. And I, I looked up your career and you've kind of been a person that's done things that uh, have, you know, were sort of new things, right? I mean, you know, there were, you were, uh, you ran Hyundai. There was a time that people thought no one would want to buy, would want to buy a Korean car. Obviously, yeah. that was wrong. You ran True Car. There was a time people thought no one would want to buy a car online. Obviously, that was wrong. Uh, and I'm talking about people. When I say people, I mean like in the automotive industry. Like no one's ever going to want to buy a car online. No one's ever going to want to buy a Hyundai. Um, when it comes to autonomous vehicles, uh, where is the auto industry wrong? Were they wrong? Yeah, like, like, like how are you oh. going to be right about this? Um, and where do you see what their skepticism is about it? Yeah, I, I, think, I think the auto industry is there now. Um, you know, I think the opportunity that they had to be a little bit earlier um, is sort of, sort of water under the bridge. It, it's passed, right? Um, but, I, but I think in a lot of the things that you mentioned, it's, it's, it's always been about safety. And I think, I think the auto industry has had at its hands opportunities to do more um, and make safety features standard and just put them on every car. It's one of the things that we did at Ford on sport utility vehicles um, back when I was there. It's one of the things we did at Hyundai as well. We put side impact airbags and electronic stability control on, on all the Hyundai cars because we knew that was just, it was just the right thing to do and you shouldn't ask folks who are buying a car to choose between a sunroof um, and electronic stability control or side impact airbags, right? You, you know that that's going to be a better outcome um, for the world if you just put that technology on on everything. Um, so I think the industry is, is moving in that direction now. Um, there's a technology that's on its way to autonomy called automatic emergency braking. Um, it's something that the industry is aware of will save lives and save accidents and save collision damage. Um, and the industry is trying to move in the direction of putting that on every car. Um, but they're struggling with it because how do you make the economic case, right? It's, it's one of those things that um, is challenging when you're in an individual company trying to make that individual decision. Do I want to put automatic emergency braking on every car right now? Um, personally, I think they should, and it would be an amazing selling point for the first brand to do that. Um, but it takes time. Um, this is a whole nother thing that we're talking about. And it's somewhat different from um, automotive technology because it is, um, as we discussed at the very start so of you this, don't feel like building drivers. I guess my question is, you, you don't feel like this is an attempt to try to, this is not gonna eliminate the, the auto industry? Not at all, have. yeah. I mean, I from, mean, you're obviously buying Chrysler minivans, but. Right, from Waymo's perspective, um, we, are, we are partners um, to the auto industry and we've, we've always considered ourselves in this space enablers of, of the incumbents. So car companies build great cars, we don't wanna build cars. Uh, we want to put drivers in those cars and make them more efficient and safer. Um, we're using other aspects of the traditional, traditional auto industry to help our business too. We have a partnership with Avis um, to maintain our cars and handle some of the fleet maintenance aspects. We have a partnership with AutoNation, um, which is the U.S.'s largest automotive retailer, uh, biggest dealer, to also help maintain um, our cars. So we want to use those existing parts of the auto industry because they're very good um, at what they do. And what we're doing is adding a different layer, a different piece of the recipe, which is um, the driver itself to that. So I guess, was it, was it this week or last week you announced another program uh, for the Waymo driver, which is, it's now, it's now, it's going to be in large trucks in Atlanta? In trucking, yeah. Yeah, tell me yeah. about that. So um, yeah, Atlanta is a big logistics hub um, for the US, as you might know. And it turns out Google has um, some of our um, logistics going through that hub of Atlanta for our data centers, which are um, placed all around the US. Um, so what we're doing now with our autonomous um, Waymo technology is we've, we've put that in a big Peterbilt 
um, class eight truck, the really big um, trucks that you see on the road. Carrying semi truck. Trailers. Like the semi truck. Semi truck. Got it. Yeah, it's a okay. semi truck. Right. Um, and we're testing that technology there in a logistics mode because it makes a lot of sense there too. Um, I don't know if you guys know this in the, in the trucking industry, but right now um, we're short in the US alone 50,000 drivers compared to the needs of the trucking industry and that's projected to grow to something like 175,000 driver shortage by 2023, 2024. Um, so we feel like this technology is something that could help make the trucking sector even stronger. Make it stronger is in how, what do you like? I mean, because I mean, th this gets right in the heart of the idea of where people are nervous about what autonomous vehicles are going to do, right? There are thousands of people who drive Uber every day, th or and Lyft and everything else, thousands of people who drive cabs, thousands of people who drive trucks. Um, you, you're saying that, that this is going to be a good thing for them if there's more Waymo trucks? I think, in general, for the trucking and logistics industry, um, absolutely. But I think, to your point, Evan, about thinking about job displacement. That's incumbent upon us. It's incumbent upon all those in the space to really think carefully through how is this going to end up for drivers in particular? Because there will be, there will inevitably be local displacements as this technology takes off. Um, sure, there will be offsetting additive jobs in, in other areas, but, but what's the total balance going to be? Um, we're working with um, distinguished partners in the space to understand that, and we want to get on top of that. And yeah, I want to ask you about now. that because I feel like people today have a, a, a different feeling about corporate responsibility. That Do you feel like there's a job of your company to be proactive in making sure that people who are going to maybe have their livelihoods change because of uh, a, a Waymo truck coming in, is there any obligation of your company to help that person maintain their livelihood? I think from a Waymo standpoint, we, we absolutely feel that responsibility. And, and I think the first responsibility is understanding what is the, what's the net outcome going to be um, for us in and around this space, driven by our technology. We absolutely own that. Um, and then figuring out what those local displacements and how they might be handled um, in a very humane way is also something we'd love to take on. It's very early days for us, but I think it's something we want to stay ahead of. Right. I mean, we're not going to see these Waymo trucks all over the place anytime. It's still early it's still days. still early, yeah. And I want to ask you another corporate responsibility question just because since I, I, I am at South by Southwest and I have a, a, a tech CEO on a stage. Mm. Um, we read so much about uh, these days about the experience of uh, women employees in Silicon Valley yeah. not, being, not feeling very welcome there, uh, especially in the mobility space, right? I don't have to mention that. Um, is it as bad as we hear? You know, I think, I think we have a really good and thriving culture at, at Waymo. And again, as a, as a sister company to Google, we have a lot of that same um, spirit, which is great. Um, that said, the, the level of representation um, at Waymo, as at Google and a lot of tech companies in the Valley right now, is low. Um, it's not as good as we'd like to see. And, and we see it in our company at Waymo. We're an interesting combination of software engineers and, and hardware engineers. And where there's an extraordinarily low level of representation is on the hardware side. Um, it's very, very hard for us to find um, women engineers with hardware experience. Um, we need to build out these vision systems and compute systems and, and radar and LIDAR. Um, it's, a big, it's a big pipeline problem I think we need to solve. Um, what do you, how do you think you solve that? What do you think is in the standing in the way of that? Honestly, we don't, we don't have the answers right now, but it goes all the way back to um, the STEM education um, efforts that we need. Um, getting more women, more qualified women um, in the space by getting them into these programs at a very early age, um, junior high school, high school, and, and into the universities. Okay, and you feel like that's something that's, that's something that you feel as an important part of your job? Like, do you feel that pressure yeah, in we, your job? Yeah, we do. We feel that pressure already, even though we're, we're a relatively young company. Got it. Let me just remind everybody, uh, Slido, uh, hashtag South by Southwest for questions for John. I just have a couple more and then we're going to ask some of yours. So um, let me ask just really quickly, which is sort of the one that gets us in the way. Like, because I think the two, que the, the two main questions of a talk like this are, uh, uh, what do you have? You know, and you've kind of talked about that. And then yeah. sort of what's in the way of um, when am I going to get it, basically, is the question, right? Yeah. So. You know, I cover a lot of politics, I, I cover a lot of political stories, and I feel like we're at a moment right now where a lot of politicians are not as pro-innovation as they have been in the past. This mm -hmm. sort of rise of populism has been a lot of talk about things like automation, things like uh, new technology, and, it's, uh, and the way it can affect people's jobs and lives. Politicians are a little bit more nervous about sort of embracing it as they used to be. And I wonder if you can just talk a bit about where 
how our politics today are affecting your ability to expand your company and expand where you're trying to put this technology? I think for the most part, Evan, um, the, the people in positions of power um, are, are, are joined together by the life-saving potential and the improvements in mobility and accessibility that the technology provides. So that's been great. Um, you know, and, and if, if you break it down federal, state, and local level, um, at the federal level, it has been rare the last couple of years to see any venture, any initiative that's been embraced by both, by both parties. Um, but we've seen that. We've seen positive, uh, a positive reception uh, for the bills in Congress not right now related to self-driving cars. Um, so we're optimistic things will get done um, uh, at the federal level. Um, at the state level, um, you know, the important thing there is um, for the states to recognize um, that their role is really regulating the driver. And what, what we'd like as Waymo is for them to understand that, you know, as, as long as you hold us to the same standards as human drivers, I think we'll be fine, right, in terms of, of the regulatory environment at the state level. Um, what would be weird is if states put separate and unique regulations in place um, for Waymo drivers compared to human drivers, right? Um, that's something that wouldn't necessarily be helpful. And then at the what local mean, level. What do, you, what do you mean, like like, uh, like a Waymo had oh, a different like, sort of speed, speed limit, limit or, or something, something like, like that? that. Okay, okay, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it, I think it's, it's our job to um, show that our cars are safe and to, f and to have the same laws applied to us as this currently apply to human drivers at the state level. And at the local level, um, you know, I, I, a lot of um, folks at the local level are really interested in attracting our technology and, and, and having Weibo launch a service like we have in Phoenix in their cities. Um, and one of the things they often come to us with is, and we'll make infrastructure changes um, that support your business. And our reply back to them is, wait, wait, wait. Um, our technology is, has been developed on this principle that we don't need any special infrastructure. That's sort of the point of what we want to do is um, be as least as good as a human driver, um, but also not require any infrastructure change or spending. Um, and that's always been positively received as we share that with the local officials. We don't need you know, any dedicated lanes of traffic or anything like that. Um, just give us access to the things that, that human drivers have access to today. People feel like politics today are keeping things from advancing, but you're saying that I say we really haven't you can felt roll that. that out. You can roll out what you're doing despite everything that's going on. That's right. That's right. Okay, so my last question is just, look, okay, so, you know, it's 2028, yeah. and I'm, uh, you know, getting out of an airport what's the, uh, somewhere in America. What's the likelihood I'm pressing a button and getting a Waymo to pick me up? So if, if you're a Waymo user, um, you've probably um, let us know that you're going to be on that flight and, <laughs> and you want the car to um, pick you up. By then, we will have cars that are configured and tailored for individual missions or rides. So if we know that you're um, alone with your usual two giant bags of, uh, of stuff, we'll have just the right size car. Maybe giant it's a one, one, passenger, uh, <laughs> one passenger vehicle with room for two large bags. And we'll have a car in that form factor um, for you. Well, I guess my question is more of like, how likely is it that if I'm at a, an, an airport in the country and it's 10 years from now, I'm getting into a Waymo? 100%. Really? Yeah. 10 years, 100%. 2028, 20, 100%. Okay. There we go. See, people? See? See? <laughs> you were waiting for that whole time. All right. Okay. Let's do some audience questions. Um, I have some in front of me. I see like three in front of me. They've been voted up by people. 59 upvotes for this first one. The, okay. This, you yeah. want, you want, you want to do this first it. one? Um, okay, the first one is, what is your vision for what passengers will be doing in autonomous cars? You already said maybe... Napping. Right. Napping. This would be the best outcome. But no, that's sort of a joke. I wanted more of a laugh for that. Um, no, I mean, if, if you look at the productivity benefits that self-driving cars will bring, it's really freeing us from the enslavement of driving and the fact that we need to be fully attentive during our, you know, hour and 30 minutes of combined commute time in, in the morning, the, in the daytime. Imagine freeing that up and you can be productive in any way that you want. Um, so I'd, I'd love for folks to just do whatever they want to do and be productive in the ways that they want to be. Just a, just a passive... It's just a, it's, the commute is just a passive experience. Yeah, they could be working, but they don't have to be worried um, right. about the world around them and the, and the crazy traffic. That Maybe that date night we talked about, but I don't know. For example. Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay, um, and look, this is one that keeps coming up. I don't under, this keeps coming up, which is, so we have two of them that are sort of along the same lines. All right, what's your perspective on the ethical dilemma of self-driving cars when an accident is unavoidable? Who should the vehicle save and who should it harm? 
the other one is sort of similar to this, which is like, if it can't be controlled remotely, how do you solve? Yeah. People always want to know, they always want to know, when is your robot going to kill someone? <laughs> so can you please explain to me how your robot either does or does not make a decision to kill? Do you, <laughs> I love the way you framed it. It's much more entertaining than these. Um, so so there's, there's this one. These don't show. These don't show up. Yeah, OK. okay. The question yeah. is, Oh, um, I, the question was, was like, how does it make a decision? I mean, the question was, how does it make a decision in a situation where it has to, it has to save somebody? Yeah. Who the, to save? This so is, that's, I mean, that's, that, I'm rephrasing it, but that, that is what the person is asking. Right. This is known as the trolley problem. Right. And it, I, every time I talk to anybody about this, yeah. this is what they want to know. They're all, right. they, they want to know when does this happen? How does this work? Yeah. Does, so can I, can I see a raise of hands, uh, a show of hands? I've always wondered how many of you, like when I say, oh, this is the trolley problem, how many know what the trolley problem is? Uh, about 20, half. 22%. No, I think 22 percent. 22 percent. 22 percent. No, it's political trolley. journalist, <laughs> uh, engineer. engineer. There you go. Engineer. That's how um, it works. The, okay. the trolley problem is this one. It's like, oh my gosh. In in um, let's say that you're given the choice as as a human, um, and you're you're controlling a, a railroad track thing, and you can either have this car go straight, and kill one person. No, kill five people, um, or you could turn a switch, move a lever, and it would move in another direction and just kill one people or one person. So you would have the choice between doing nothing and seeing five people die, but at least you would have done nothing, um, or taking an active role yourself and moving that train so that it, it hits just one person. But then you would be responsible uh, for the death of that one person. Um, how, how we look at the situation um, at Waymo is to say, basically, wait a minute, this is an invalid question. Because um, with our sensing and our technology, we can see three football fields down the road. We would see the group of five people. We would see the, the, the one person over there. And we would come to a stop before we ran into either of these um, two folks. And I know that often seems like an unsatisfying answer, because um, maybe trolley problem specialists you know, want to say, well, which is the one you're going to choose? And we really do have the confidence in the technology that that is one of the advantages that we have, that we can see so much further down the road, that we see everything in 360 with three modalities, um, that we could stop um, safely before we have to make that dire choice. Do you ever get jealous of the Roomba guys? No one ever asked them when their robot's going to kill somebody? The Roomba guys, yeah. <laughs> no sorry, we should throw it right back at them. But I mean, <laughs> But I mean, but, but suffice to say, you don't actually, this is not something you plan for. Because I think people are interested in this. There's yeah. not some sort of uh, law of robotics or something inside this car that's like, all right, we must say there, this. The, the thing that second. we do have is um, we have an understanding of who the most vulnerable um, road users are. Um, so if we see um, children, um, we are more cautious than we are around adults. Um, and then motorcyclists, and then cars and trucks. So there is that hierarchy. So it does um, make it, have. it does have some, so, some some ethics to it in that way. I wouldn't say ethics, but but really more care and concern um, related to the vulnerability of the user. So when it what what happens with kids versus adults, sort of in a street, it would, it would just be we'll just be much more cautious. slower. Yeah. So it sort of more, more mimics a human driver in that way. You yep. probably would. That's right. Okay. Interesting. But there. But there. Okay. All right. Um, and all right, so we got the, uh, what about this one down here? Autonomous car ownership versus a service. You've decided to roll this out as yeah, sort of so a thing that, that's more similar to uh, what we've seen with a rideshare app. Why that versus selling me a Pacifica minivan that drives itself to put in my driveway? Because if I sold you that car, you would only use it 5% of the time. And it would be sort of sad for the world that, wow, you have this amazing thing that can move you very safely from point A to point B. Why don't you just let us share it, Evan, with, with others? So um, we can make a bigger impact on the world, get more people in the car, and, and, and handle more trips and deliver more net safety um, by having a service as opposed to an individual car. That doesn't say that someday we wouldn't have um, you know, a licensing deal with, uh, with a car maker to say, yeah, you can put this on your personal use car. But for us, it just hasn't been a priority. I think we'll get there someday, um, but our priority has been getting a service going. So, I mean, is this a matter of just public, uh, you know, not being, not fully understanding this yet, or is this uh, something new that you're trying to do? I mean, my question is, is it sort of uh, necessary that if we have a self-driving car world, individual car ownership just sort of goes away? No, I, I think there will be a mix. I think there will be personally owned self-driving cars. It's just that Waymo isn't pushing that as a primary aspect of our business model. We want to do the service first. Um, we're interested in, in trucking and logistics. Um, and then this, this concept of personal car ownership is probably third um, 
in, in terms of priority for us. All right. Um, we got the Uber one. Do you want to answer that question, man? No. <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Whatever. Uh, all right. Uh, so uh, <laughs> I, I actually don't. Know, I actually don't know enough about it. Um, but the the like that first one. Okay. Yeah. What, but but isn't that? Aren't you saying? Okay. So this first one is. How far away is a level five drive anywhere car? Aren't you yeah. saying that it's not far away? It's here now? No, not, not necessarily. So that's interesting. I think the level five drive anywhere car um, is very, very far away. Um, so level five means it can drive anywhere in any weather condition um, at any time. Um, I don't even think humans are level five in, in many ways. Um, because if you think about it, when it's a really, really bad weather condition, a torrential downpour, have you ever been caught in a torrential downpour? You typically pull over, right? It's, it's, it's extraordinarily frightening to drive in that situation. Um, so I'm not sure we humans are, are level five, and maybe the SAE practitioners of the definition um, would disagree with my interpretation of the rule, but I think for the most part, level four takes you um, as far as you need to go. Like we'll be able to serve every major metro area um, with our service. I'm absolutely confident about that by 2028. Um, but will we have one car that can drive anywhere in the world at any time in any weather condition whatsoever? I don't know. I don't know that the technology will ever get that far. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, what are the weather conditions now? They're sort of like you, you mentioned testing in other places. How does weather affect this? I mean, you, you, you talk about Phoenix. This is a pretty predictable place weather-wise. Yeah. Um, in Snow a place that's not, I mean, look, I mean, I, I live up, I live in DC where we've had now a series of like really crazy weather lately. Um, yeah. how do, can your car drive and stuff like that? Snow and ice are, are challenging for our current system. We're on the, on the fourth revision of our self-driving system right now. And we have not, for example, built in um, defroster elements to all the vision, um, the vision elements of the car. Um, so it's specifically not been designed um, to handle situations like that. Um, our next revision will have that capability, but, but that's just one example of, of snow and ice being particularly challenging Got it. for what we have right now. Definitely solvable. Has a Waymo car ever been pulled over by a cop? If not, how would that hypothetically pay, play out? We did get pulled over. Um, yeah, and, and, and actually there's a photograph of it, and I, I thought it was one of the, the sweetest photos I've ever seen. So one of our little Firefly cars got pulled over by a motorcycle cop in Mountain View um, because he wanted to see how the self-driving car would react. Um, and, and we, no kidding, and, and we, do, um, we do train our cars to pull over. Um, Your car was profiled by a police officer. We believe it was profiled. You're this is the cutest photo you've ever seen? But what, here, here's why it was cute. I mean, so um, our, our Firefly car, that, that first car that you saw in the, in the video driving through the streets of Austin, it's sort of adorable and, and intentionally so. Um, we wanted to, ha to have this very friendly, appealing appearance. And the photograph of the car, it's just an immortal photo, is this big, burly motorcycle cop getting off his motorcycle, and he's walking up to the car like this. And as you look at this photo, you can't but feel sorry for the poor little self-driving car <laughs> that was pulled over. It's like, why did that guy, and it, it sort of looked like a profiling thing. You know? Well, this speaks a little bit to that privacy. And the car did nothing wrong, honestly. It did nothing wrong. But this speaks a little bit to that privacy question that we answered before, right? Because I can sort of see the idea, you know, if, uh, if I get into a, a Waymo and a, a cop wants to catch me, did, 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 can the police just call you up and tell you to drive me to the police station or the jail or whatever? Is that something <laughs> that you guys are doing? Um, that's not in the current thing right now. We uh -huh. don't have that, but it's not a crazy idea. But we would pull over once it flashed its lights behind us. Okay, and so the, the, the thing is aware of that. Yeah. All right, and, it, and it, uh, maybe it's adorably pulled over by a cop to just want to see what it will do. That seems... Yeah. Okay, all right. With um, all right, and then, okay, so and then, look, this is a question about how would Waymo do in busy European cities with small streets like Amsterdam? Would it be waiting forever? When will you test in Europe? This is another question about sort of that we just sort of talked about versus the weather thing, yeah. which is I something I think about too, not even thinking about some place like Amsterdam where the streets are so small, but even some place like New York or DC, mm -hmm. where these are not car designed cities like a Phoenix is. That's right. How does a vehicle like yours perform in a place like that, where driving is a, like really hard for people who are actually, for humans, who are very experienced in it? Yeah, so we've had, we've had some experience on roads like that in our testing in San Francisco. We have tested in 25 US cities. Um, so maybe not ancient European cities, um, but it's definitely solvable. And 
Yeah, we will definitely be in Europe as well with this technology, no question. All right, uh, great. Well, let's wrap it up real quick. Let me just say, what is the next, uh, the next city people should be looking for to get their Waymo app and start riding around Waymos? That's the question everybody wants to know. I do know the answer, but I can't tell you. <laughs> Okay, well, on that note, all right, <laughs> Sorry, everybody, uh, this is John Krafcik from Waymo. Thank you all for coming in. Your questions are very good. Thank you. Um, really appreciate it. I'm not sure how we exit, but it was just really good. Yeah, Thank you very much. Thanks I enjoyed so much. myself. Um, great.